Hallelujah. This morning, we observe the first week of Advent. For those of us unfamiliar with the term, Advent is a season where Christians around the world prepare for Christmas. Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, meaning coming. And it does not only refer to the first coming Christ, but also to his return as the second coming Lord. Now, it has been the practice of the church to devote itself to one of four aspects of the gospel for each week of Advent, namely hope, love, joy, and peace. And so this morning we come to hope, and we set our eyes on hope. Now, there are two kinds of hope. The first is a hope without assurance. That is your daydreaming, your wishful thinking, your fantasizing. And there's no real reason to believe that any of it will happen. But then there's the other kind of hope, a hope with assurance. Now, I've put two very old and very expensive copies of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, two big books backstage. And Elder Paul Soon, who came up with me, saw it. The praise team members would have seen it as well. And if you were to ask them, they would tell you it's there. But can you trust them? I believe you can because they have no reason to lie. Now, the apostles had no real reason to lie as well. They had no reason to lie about the birth, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they proclaimed the gospel to their demise when it brought them suffering, torture, and death. This is because they had seen Jesus with their own eyes and they witnessed how Jesus fulfilled the covenantal promises of God. See, the Gospels do not begin with a once upon a time. But the Gospel of Matthew, in particular, begins with the genealogy of the Messiah rooted in history. The Messiah has come as promised. The Messiah has fulfilled the promises. And he is coming back to finish the very last one. This means that the Gospel is good news. It is not just good advice. And so this morning, some of us perhaps might still hope in Jesus and the gospel story without any assurance, without any certainty. But I want to encourage you this morning to take active steps to grow in your assurance. And this is of utmost importance, and it must be done without any delay. And here is why. Now, St. Augustine was one of the most prominent fathers of the early church. And in the 5th century, he wrote a book called The City of God. And in it, he talks about two cities. There's the city of God and the city of man. Now, all human beings live in the city of man with all its godless vice and worldly pleasures. But as for Christians, they have changed allegiance. They have changed governor and they are now citizens of the city of God and are currently living in the city of man. And the governor of the city of man knows this. Who is this governor? The Apostle Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So Adam and Eve, in obeying the word of the serpent, had submitted themselves and the human race to the authority of the serpent. And the serpent is a cruel governor who drags us along in following the course of this world, of the city of man. And when the course of this world meets its end, woe to its citizens. Woe to those who fail to prove their heavenly citizenship. And what is that proof if not faith? And what is that faith if not without assurance? 
So we must take action to grow in our assurance without delay before our Lord returns. The world will mock us for it. They will call us mentally fragile, smoking a spiritual opium. They will say that church is a waste of time, of money, of effort. The governor of the city of man will tempt us with what his city has to offer. Power, fame, wealth, comfort, safety. But the last of these is a lie. There is no safety for those living under Satan's jurisdiction. And so St. Augustine writes about the efforts of the enemy to gain a foothold in our hearts. He says that every human being has an ordo amoris, an order of affections or loves. It's a ladder of loves. And at the very top of that ladder sits a throne. And whatever sits on that throne governs our lives and makes decisions for us. And as it stays seated up there, we offer sacrifices to it. For example, if your career sits on the throne, then it's going to demand that you work harder and harder for your next promotion. It's going to demand that you work overtime, sacrificing your time with family, for hobbies, and so on. And whatever is enthroned in your heart is going to demand that you constantly think about it, look at it, and anchor your life upon it. But here's the crucial point. If that thing seated up there is from the city of man, it's going to be a cruel governor over your life. And that's because such things do not last. They are temporary, fleeting attractions used by the enemy to keep us distracted from the impending fate of his city. He knows he's going down, and all he wants is to drag us along, using his weapons of mass distraction. And we have a case in point in the story of Abraham and Lot. We have two citizens of the city of God living in the city of man. And so in today's scripture passage, we have Abraham and Lot. Now, Abraham and Lot have been, th have been through thick and thin together. When God called Abraham to the promised land, Lot followed. So the two of them reached the land of Canaan, and God tells them, to your offspring, I will give this land. That's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. But the promised land fails to meet their expectations. All of a sudden, three verses later, the harvest fails, the supermarket prices skyrocket, and they're at risk of starvation. They must have been so confused. God, didn't you promise to bless me? What is this? And so they look to Egypt. They see its abundance, its luxuries, its comforts, and they decide to compromise with their faith. God, I'll come back as soon as things get better. But for now, I'm going elsewhere. God's promise had lost its place on their ladder of loves, and now Egypt sits on the throne. And as the new cruel governor, Egypt demands a sacrifice. And so Abraham sacrifices his wife. Tell them you're my sister, he says. And he remains silent as Pharaoh claims Sarai for himself and takes her into his bedchamber. And he receives the abundant gifts of Egypt, his sheep, oxen, donkeys, camels, and servants. And we see what happens next. God judges Pharaoh and Egypt with plagues, and Abraham and Lot leave the land of Egypt for the promised land once more. That's all in Genesis chapter 12. But then comes another test. They're both now wealthy nomads with an abundance of livestock, but the promised land is unable to support their parallel prosperity. And whereas the land once failed them when they had nothing, it now fails them when they have everything. So it says in Genesis 13 verse 6, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And so Abraham gives Lot the first choice. 
even though he was the elder. And in giving Lot the first choice, he was really giving the first choice to God. God, whatever it is you want me to have, I will have it. Be it a land of little or a land of plenty, I will hold on to your promise. And here Abraham evidences his true repentance before God and assurance in God's promise. And so he says to Lot in verse 9, Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If you take the right hand, I will go to the left. And what's happened in Abraham's heart is that he's refused to entertain the temptations of the city of man. He's not giving the enemy a foothold into his heart. And his selfless actions here evidence that he is living as a citizen of the city of God. He has changed governor. In other words, he has enthroned the God of blessings rather than the blessings of God. Now, what about Lot? Had his repentance remained at the mere level of geography? Now, if you were to open your phones and open Google Maps and search for Israel, you will see that it's a very tall but skinny land. And what this tells us is that Abraham was probably facing either east or west as he offered Lot to go to the left hand or to the right hand. They were facing east or west. And so what Abraham was really saying was, Lord, if you go to the north, I will go to the south. But if you go to the south, I will go to the north. But what does Lot do? Genesis chapter 13 verse 10, we see, it says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zohar. Now, Lot does what any normal person would do. He scales to the highest vantage point and looks for the most opportune place and chooses it for himself. And he heads not to the north nor to the south, but to the east. And it isn't sin to grab a good opportunity. That's not the point of this message. In fact, Lot chose an area which was still within the boundary of the promised land. So we could say that he wasn't breaking God's promise either. So what's the problem? The problem is that Lot saw the boundary of God's promise and he sprinted up right to the edge. He had started compromising with his faith and would soon compromise his faith entirely. Now, to those of us who are dating, you need to know the boundaries, yeah? You need to know what you can or cannot do. But that doesn't mean that you should do anything or everything you can get away with. That's not the point. When you start compromising with your faith, you will soon compromise your faith. Your greed and your lust must not govern your actions. But we see this in Lot. Whatever dictated his steps to move eastward to the Jordan Valley was not God, but his blessings. And in the the Bible, movement to the east has an ominous spiritual meaning. It's bad news. For example, the entrance to the tabernacle was on the east. And so to move eastward was to depart from the tabernacle and from the Lord's presence. Cain departed from the Lord and journeyed east. That's in Genesis 4 verse 16. The builders of the Tower of Babel also journeyed to the east. Genesis chapter 11, verse 2. We know how they end up. So Lot's journey eastward indicates not only the physical movement of his body, but the spiritual movement of his soul. And this is made plain in the descriptions of Lot's area of choice. Now, a Jewish scholar by the name of Robert Alter wrote a commentary on the book of Genesis. And on this passage, this is what he says. He says that what we're getting here in Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, is not just the voice of the narrator. Grammatically speaking, what we're getting is the way Lot's heart interprets what he sees. And so here, God gives us a glimpse into the inner workings of Lot's heart. 
So let's have a look closer at these descriptions. First, it says, It was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. And next, it was like the land of Egypt. Now this first description tells us that Lot wanted to recreate a garden of the Lord. That he did so beside the city of Sodom tells us that he didn't mind its wicked inhabitants. For it says in verse 13, Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners before the Lord. And this is what it tells us, that Lot wanted the garden of the Lord, but without the Lord of the garden. And the second description tells us that even though Lot had left Egypt, Egypt had not left Lot. And the allure of Egypt still had its grip over Lot's heart. And that motivated him to move into the Jordan Valley. As a citizen of the city of God, Lot still lusted after the things of the city of man. And the Israelites, hundreds of years later, would too dream of Egypt as they journeyed to the promised land. As we see an example in Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 to 5, it says, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. People, how desperate must you be to dream about cucumbers? Egypt here symbolizes our lives before repentance, our lives where we didn't live according to God's word. That freedom, do you remember it? And even though many of us repent, how many of those times are we repenting of the same sins? The sins of lying, of lust, and of greed. All because we cradle in our hearts the pleasures of the city of man, the pleasures of the past, and we perhaps reserve a step or two on the ladders of our hearts, but God calls this spiritual adultery and idolatry, and we must not welcome the things of the world like this. James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, and this is what we mean when we say that even though Lot had left Egypt, Egypt had not left Lot. We must guard our hearts against the allure of the enemy. And if we hope in the things of this world, they will fail us in the day of judgment. And their governor will bring us down with him. And that day of judgment is foreshadowed in the additional comment. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so herein lies another reason to hope in the city of God. Lot wanted to indulge in the things of the city of man. He compromised with his faith and moved right beside the city of Sodom. But it wasn't long before he moved into the city itself. Genesis chapter 14 verse 12, it says, They also took Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. See, by the very next chapter, Lot was already dwelling in Sodom. He had moved out of the Jordan Valley and moved into the city itself. And he gets kidnapped, and Abraham rescues him, and guess what? Lot returns back to Sodom. In fact, by Genesis chapter 19, what we see is that Lot is now seated at the city gate. This means that he's on the board of governors of the city. And what's more, his two daughters are engaged with two men from Sodom. He's fully immersed himself in the city of man. But Lot doesn't get to enjoy this life for long. Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, it says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Only six chapters pass by before the city is destroyed by sulfur and fire. And now six chapters feels like a long time when we're picking up our Bibles at 11 p.m. But for Lot, he was just getting started. He had work to do. He had marriages to plan. He had businesses to expand. But in the blink of an eye, he lost everything. 
And the book of James gives us a similar warning. Come now, it says in chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Lot had given up all hope in God's promise. He had given up his heavenly citizenship for the privileges of the city of man. God had no place in his ordo amoris, on his ladder of loves in his heart. But somehow, he was spared from the judgment, from the wrath of God. And this brings us to our third and final character in the city of man, now we must notice a special element in this story. See, in Genesis chapter 18, the Lord appears to Abraham as a group of three men. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 2, it says, And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of, this, of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. Having, having enjoyed Abraham's hospitality and then having promised the birth of Isaac, the Lord then faces Sodom. We know what happens next. Abraham bargains for the salvation of the city. There are not even ten righteous. And out of the three men, two of them, angels, came to Sodom and they warned Lot about the judgment of the city. It says in Genesis chapter 19, verse 15, As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of this city. And because of these two angels, Lot escapes the judgment of fire. Now, you might be wondering with me, where is the third? And this is just a speculation. It's not made explicit. But I reckon that the third person, the Lord himself, brought the fire. See, God saved Lot from the judgment, even though Lot had no place for him in his heart. And I'm still speculating here, but perhaps these two angels from God foreshadow Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, who come to the, whom he sends to the city of man, to us in our wickedness, to warn us of the coming judgment, and to offer salvation and amnesty. Now, the city of man has many names. It is called Egypt. It is called Sodom, and the book of Revelation calls it both. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, it says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Now here, 2,000 years ago, in the city of man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was born. Here, he declared the impending arrival of the city of God, and on the cross, Jesus bore the judgment of God's wrath and gave us citizenship that, me, that we may walk through the pearly gates when our time on earth is done. And so even though we live in the world, we are not of it. As Jesus prayed to the Father, John chapter 17, verses 14 to 17, it says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify in the, them in the truth. Your word is truth. So, in conclusion, how shall we journey to the city of God? Now, this Advent season, we anticipate the birth of Jesus and his return. Some of us have come here this morning with a heavy heart. You might have received a bad report from your doctor, your teacher, your manager, your customer, your mother, for me, perhaps my pastor. But let's find comfort in the Word of God and let this Advent season be a time of recentering on the hope that never fades, a hope that is eternal, and a hope that we can welcome from afar. 
See, the gospel is a hope that gets clearer and clearer as the cross we bear gets heavier and heavier. And the Apostle Paul was no stranger to trials. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he writes, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So therefore, what shall we do? We are not to wait passively with idle hands, but in vigor and diligence. And to this point, the book of Hebrews gives us three exhortations. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So, first, we must lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. What does this mean? It means that we should reflect on the ordo amores of our hearts. The enemy is constantly trying to purchase a unit to take up residence in our hearts. And he offers a larger and larger sum each day. Have we given the things of the world a foothold on the ladder of our hearts? Let us vacate their flats. Let us not be nice landlords. Next, we must run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now the word for endurance here is hupomone, meaning the capacity to hold up or bear up in the face of difficulty. Now this means that our journey to the city of God will be difficult, but it will not be long. The racetrack has already been set, and so the brevity of the city of man translates into the levity of our hearts. Third, we must look to Jesus. But how can we look to Jesus when we cannot see him? We must scour and scavenge the scriptures, all of which testify of Jesus. We must pour through the, the promises of God and how God fulfilled each and every one of them in Jesus Christ. In the words of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, we must ask our fathers and our elders, our forerunners of the faith. We must ask Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the apostles for their testimonies of Jesus. This is what it means to see him. And it is through the scriptures that our hope in Christ will not be minimized to merely wishful thinking, but maximized as a concrete assurance in his second coming. Abraham left his father's house to claim the promise of God. Jesus left his father's house to claim God's promise for us. And he's arriving soon to usher in the city of God, the kingdom of heaven itself. And so the angels, as the angels called Lot out of the city of man, so too today does our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ call us from the right hand of God in heaven. It says in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we have received the word that you have prepared for us. And this morning we come before you, bringing our hearts to your word. Father, we ask at this time, May the radiance of your word pierce into our hearts and expose the loves of our hearts. Father, have any things of the world taken up residence in our hearts? Give us the strength to cast them out. Father, is there any resistance in our hearts to your word? Purge us of the sin. 
Father, do our eyes look back to Egypt? Please lift up our eyes to you alone. Help us to see with our spiritual eyes your Son, Jesus Christ, calling us out of the city of man at your right hand. Help us to see from afar the city of God that approaches closer and closer day by day. And in this Advent season, help us, Father God, to grow in assurance and hope, a concrete hope in your Son and his return. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's give glory to God.